banked it in, and the game is tied. We're going to overtime. You wanted an overtime? I think you're going to get one. And we are headed to overtime. And we are through four in 60 minutes. Not enough. Oh, my God, we're going to overtime. What's up, everyone? Welcome into another episode of Overtime here on the Colts Audio Network and on the Colts YouTube page. I'm JJ Stankovitz. The news today, Dwight Freeney is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He is a member of the Modern Era Class of 2024. And who better to talk about number 93 than number 98? Robert Mathis, his partner on Bring the Heat Boulevard, joins me now here on Overtime. Rob, thanks so much for joining me. And I guess just First of all, what, what's your reaction to seeing your teammate Dwight Freeney get in the Hall of Fame? Uh, I'm very much not surprised because the man has earned it. Uh, I knew it was a matter of time, but I'm just still excited excited and elated that he, that he got it in. Uh, along with his uh, draft buddy, Julius Peppers. So it was just an, an amazing just to be his, being his teammate and just seeing what he did over the course of his career. And, and just being able to witness that. You were witness to, you know, so many of those sacks that Dwight had, some of those huge plays that he had, but you also knew him better than probably anyone else behind the scenes. Like, when you define Dwight's career, how do you define the player and the person and the teammate that he was? Dwight was very disciplined. He was very disciplined. Uh, he taught me just by, and it, just walk, by, by his footsteps, his footwork, just watching him, how he went about being a professional uh, on and off the field, in the classroom, the way he uh, went about his diet and exercise. And he was very innovative in, uh, in, his, in his workouts. And he brought a lot to the table in that regards. And so, trust me, I study people a lot. I don't talk a whole lot, but I really, really, really study people. And I had the chance to study him, his game, how he went about it, how he studied and the way he attacked O linemen and the way he got quarterbacks down, and I think a lot of a lot of a lot of the players today can really really learn from him and how he approached the game. Tell me a little bit about that that him being innovative with his workouts, maybe with his diet, because uh, you know when he came into the league in 2002, there wasn't as much focus on nutrition and specific exercises maybe as there is 20 years later now. What did you learn from him and just how maybe on the, the cutting edge was Dwight with some of those things to give him that little advantage uh, in, in every game? He was literally the first person I ever seen with an art machine. Uh, and that's like a, a, a STEM machine. It's an art. It's a, it's a STEM machine that helps fire, you, fire the muscles and uh, everything around it. So it promotes faster healing. And now everybody has one. All the training staffs have one. Um, uh, he used it. He used that to, to be able to play the first half of the second Super Bowl that we played in uh, versus the Saints. Uh, he was just he he stuck he stuck to the script. Whatever script he had, he stuck to it. So as far as his diet, he was also the first guy I ever seen eat uh, steak and potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> because it was it it matched his blood type. So it worked. It worked. And so a lot of people. You know, you start to ask questions. Okay, you see this man, he's doing this this diet, this exercise regimen, and he's very, very, very successful. So naturally, you're going to ask, okay, what are you doing? So I'm going to incorporate that into what I'm doing. So maximize the positive, positives, minimize the negatives. So that's what he did. That's what that, Those are the things that I learned from Dwight. I think that's so, that's so interesting because we see – the, we see the sacks, we see the strip sacks, we see the big plays that Dwight made, but those little tiny things that he did to give him an edge, like the, those are things that, you know, you can, there are so many talented players that come into the NFL, right? And then there are the guys like Dwight, like yourself, like, you know, Reggie and Marvin and Peyton and Edge, who just like do those things that separate them from being great to being elite. And for Dwight to kind of have that in him, how did he raise the level of the rest of his teammates just by being who he was with things like that? Just by, by leading, leading by example, uh, like I said, the things that he did, the, 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 the regimen and the discipline that he, that he exemplified got, it was, it was infectious. So guys kind of fed off that even like younger guys. Uh, if you're not doing something right, trust me, eventually he's going to, he's going to pull you to the side and he's going to tell you, but 
more times than not, it's, it's it was in his footwork. And so those are the things like just Peyton, uh, Edge, well, Reggie. These are guys, they, they're not going to really go chase you and lead you. They're going to show you before they tell you. And that's kind of how I, I, I operate myself. All right, you mentioned the, the 2009 AFC Championship, and I want to go, go to that where he, he has the ankle injury. There are reports all over the place that, you know, he's got like a ligament tear, that he's got a sprain, whatever it may be. What did you see from him in the two weeks from that game to the Super Bowl where he comes out, he gets a sack in the first half and plays at a high level in that game? Man, my respect went through the roof during those two weeks because it was a pretty bad injury that he had. It was no reason for him to be playing in that game, but – like I said, he was determined to play in this game, and he made it happen. And so I was – I just told him, man, I was very – I remember that going to him after the game. I said, bro, I, I really respect you, and I'm proud of you uh, for, for being out there because it meant a lot to the team. And like I said, he's he's cut from that cloth that he, that he was able to do that. A lot of people are not. Where did his drive come from? Like, where did his drive to – fight through that injury? Where did his drive to be great? Where did his drive to win championships? Where, where did you understand that to come from? Oh, he's the ultimate competitor. Uh, him and Michael Jordan are, are really good friends. And mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think we all know about the competitive drive of Michael Jordan. So, but also he's Jamaican. His, I, I, I know his parents and uh, his mother, she, she, she got a lot of tenacity. <laughs> so he gets, he gets that from his parents, man. And uh, just uh, the support system that he had, uh, growing up, uh, it was just it's just not a surprise he, he is where he is today. How did you guys bond? Like when you first got there in 03, he's still a young guy. You're from, you know, inner city, inner city Atlanta. You went to Alabama A&M. He's from the Northeast. He went to Syracuse. Obviously, you guys played the same position, played the same sport. But like, how did you guys bond back then? Uh, it was... They brought me in to, to compliment him and because he was getting loaded up on the – he came in, he came, he kicked the door in for 13 and a half sacks rookie year. So I come in – I didn't – honestly, I didn't know much about Dwight. It was just like I'm trying to get a spot. I'm just trying to get a spot. Special teams or whatever the case, and we just had this similar game. He's a little – he's he's like – maybe 20, 30 pounds heavier than I am, but uh, you can show him this. I'm taller, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, we both had a drive to get to the core of the quarterback and the same chip on our shoulder was we're both too small. We're both too this or whatever the case. So we had to get after it and we learned from the greatest defensive line coach of all time, John Tierling. And he really just let us um, use our talents on the field. That second game of your career, you had two sacks against the Titans. Dwight had one. Do you remember anything special about that game of just realizing, like, whew, we got something here between me and Dwight? I, well, I knew that uh, during practice. We would come, and uh, a lot of the times we had to figure this thing out because we used to hit each other in the backfield. <laughs> like, we used to <laughs> always run into each other, so we had to figure it out. And that's, that's when we started doing the high-low uh, the, the the organized chaos r rushes and uh, things like that. But I knew we had something. We just had to keep it going. How did you develop that chemistry with Dwight? Where I, I think that's something a lot of people don't necessarily understand about, like the art of the pass rush, is that if you're on one side, he's on the other side, you have to rush together, even if you're, you know, 10 yards apart or whatever it may be. Like, how did that chemistry come about to be something that turned into Bring the Heat Boulevard in Indianapolis? Well, just a passion for wanting to hit quarterbacks because we understood how we understood the quarterbacks are the engine to every 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 football team's uh, vehicle, and they get pampered, they get all this, they get all this stuff, they get rules changed, and so that was that kind of threw a little fuel on the fire. But we've always had uh, just a, a drive and desire to get as many quarterback sacks as possible, and the way to do that is together. They say one 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 wolf is gonna starve, but a wolf pack is gonna eat. And we had we went we went in with a wolf pack me mentality. Something I, I saw this quote from Jason Peters, who obviously played tackle in the NFL for decades, and he said that the guy he hated to face the most was Dwight. 
because every single pass rush move looked the same. When you think about that, that is a skill that Dwight had. And I know, you know, John Tierlink probably had, you know, quite a bit of a hand in just coaching that up. But the ability to not tip your hand with your pass rush so you can hit a bull rush, you can hit a spin move, you can hit, you know, whatever, you know, speed, whatever it may be. How special was that in Dwight? You just said it. It got him in the Hall of Fame. It, you can't, <laughs> you can't, you, you can't, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he he never tipped his hand. He was very good at playing. He's very good at playing cards as well. So he doesn't tip his hand. But also, pass rushers and wide receivers are synonymous because you have to make all your routes look the same and you have to make your rushes look the same. Therefore, you have to make the O-lineman guess. So when they guess, they guess wrong. So every time they anticipate a bull rush, they're going to stop their feet, lunge, and he's going to spin them. <laughs> but if he's if they're in uh, on skates, he's going to bull rush them into the quarterback. So it's, it's exactly what you said. So it was always he was always a student of the game. And so that that's that's what makes him. We're not going to say great, but elite. What uh what's Dwight's card game that you lost him the most at? I played him one time, and there was a, something called Blu ray. I lost big too, and I never played again. <laughs> because you couldn't tell what he had in his hand, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't. It's, it's like a, a pot up game, so I, I don't mess with him when it comes to that, and cars and stuff like that, because he, he'll get you. I can, I can only imagine the card games between him and Michael Jordan if they ever played together. Those, those probably got a little competitive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when you think about that 2004 season where Dwight led the NFL in sacks, like what, what all came together for him that year? I mean, he's only two years, three years into his career. Was it the, you know, the, that combo pass rush that you had with him? Was it something that he developed that year? Like how did he go about to kind of hit that mark? Because to me, that, that year really cemented him on this, not just like elite track, but on like a Hall of Fame track. At that time, I think he he finally figured it out. You know, when you first come into the league, you're kind of relying on on talent. Now he he's mixing talent with uh, classroom, with timing, with diet, ex- everything everything came together. And that that particular year, it was like he was nobody can stop him one on one. No nobody. I don't I don't care if you want to put whatever O lineman. Jonathan Ogden, he he got he got burned for three sacks, so we're not gonna do that. So I will put Dwight up against anybody one on one, and at any point in history, any O tackle. That's how much confidence and that's how much I know how dominant he was. Is that like the true mark of a Hall of Famer? That like you talk about him just getting Jonathan Ogden, a guy who was a like a no question he's in Canton guy. We're like you put him one on one against that guy, and Dwight's gonna win. Maybe Ogden wins a couple, but like he can go go and hold his own and beat that guy, you know, quite a few times. Yeah, there's the mark of a, of an elite, a great elite player. Put him against another elite player, and you and trust him to win. Give him a one on one, and he's not going to get shut out. A lot of guys, a lot of players these days, they kind of they kind of they kind of run away from the Trent Williams, the Lane Johnsons. No, you got to I'm going over here all game. And we finna see what's up. And Dwight never shied away from that. Did Reggie Wayne ever shy away from that as a corner, you know, going against top cornerbacks? No, absolutely not. It was uh, was that uh, Darrell Reeves at the time? It was no, throw me the ball. And if it, you don't throw me the ball, I might cuss you out. So <laughs> Reggie had Reggie Reggie got dog a lot of dog in him. So no, that's and that's a mentality that, like I say, I don't want to start talking old man gibberish here, but. It's, it's, it's kind of getting lost now. So there's a, there's a, there's guys like Zaire Franklin. He he's a dog. He's not gonna shy away uh, shy away from it. So but yeah, Dwight got that. Give me give me the best guy. Let's go. With the 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 Hall of Fame process, it's you know we're all celebrating Dwight here, but we also are acknowledging like it sucks that Reggie Wayne's not in. That it's taken it's now five times as a finalist. He hasn't got in. Like. You, you know, you've been through this a little bit. You've been a semifinalist now a couple times. Um, how just like, how much to, it, just of a gut punch is it that like Reg hasn't got his flowers yet from Canton? And like, we, we know he will. We hope he will. But like, 
You saw him. You're a teammate of his. You won a Super Bowl with the guy. You saw what he did in the playoffs. Just that, that it's almost like boggles my mind that he hasn't got in yet. Like, how do you kind of react to that? And in regards to myself, it's your time is your time. In regards to my friend Reggie, it's some it's some it's some bug. <laughs> straight up, straight up. I mean, I I don't know if you're gonna bleep that out or whatever, but it's some it's some BS because you you just if it's about what he did as a player, he should have he should have been a first ballot. Uh, but I also understand it, it is like a traffic jam at wide receiver right now, mm-hmm. and now you got to go back. He, he knows he's gonna get in. I, everybody knows he's going to get in because now you want to put put him up stat for stat. Most of his numbers are better than Andre Johnson, but Andre Johnson did it with no quarterback, <laughs> none, none at all. So it's it's he knows his time is coming because Reggie is elite. I think, well, I know everybody knows that, but you just hate that they keep stringing him along. But he knows he's going to get in. You got another teammate, uh, former teammate, who's going to be up next year in uh, Adam Vinatieri. Um, you know, a guy who's going to draw strong, strong consideration to be the second kicker to make the Hall of Fame. Just what what made Vinny great? What made him a guy who could be in the position that one other kicker has been in in the history of this league? If Vinny is not first ballot, you, you just throw it all away. Throw it all away. He is the greatest kicker of all time. The Iceman. What can you say? What he put on film speaks for itself. He's the greatest at his position of all time. So that in itself warrants first ballot. They shouldn't even, they shouldn't even play, this, play this game right here. He's first ballot. Now, I will say, speaking for myself, also, I, I think the strip sack also, king. Go ahead. Real quick, real quick with, with uh, Vinny. He, he gave a lot of wisdom about how to be, about the history of the game, how to go about the game, and how to be, successful off the field as well with a uh, business at uh, business venture. So he's, he's a, he's a, he was like a father figure to a lot of guys. He was my brother cause we're in the same age, age range, but he really led from behind the scenes and people respected him the same way they respected Peyton. So it was no doubt he was our leader. So that, that coming from a kicker, usually kickers are what, you know, out of sight, out of mind. You kick when you're supposed to. Um, that had to be pretty special to have that from a kicker. Yeah, nobody bucked back against Vinny. When Vinny said something, it, that that's what it was. Um, the just the I mean the last thing for me here, just I, I think you should be in strong consideration for the Hall of Fame. You're the strip sack king for God's sakes. Um, but now you're kind of applying your trade, uh, teaching youth around here in Indiana. Um, you know, going into schools and helping kids out with uh, teaching them football, teaching them the art of the pass rush, teaching them about life. You're you're in what year three doing Gridiron Gang? Just want to speak on that a little bit. What you've you've kind of accomplished and how rewarding that is for you? Uh, yeah, uh, the original Gridiron Gang. Uh, we've been at this since 2018, actually, and so we have we have the pleasure of having all of IPS, and it's every position. We even do girls flag football. Uh, 707 camps and everything around the city. But the beauty of it is uh, through like donors like the Colts and uh, Pat McAfee, we're able to scholarship all of our children, mo- majority of our children, and uh, and just have them to go through through, the, through our program for free. So it's all positions, uh, speed and agility, and we emphasize on more than just pass rush and more than just football, but it's uh, financial literacy, uh, dining etiquette, and uh, social media awareness which is which gets a lot of people in trouble so it's like uh, we try to make it a one-stop shop and uh, just have and just have an all-encompassing uh, program for our, for our youth i think it's great work that you know you and uh, daniel Muir are doing with gridiron gang keep it up and uh, hopefully you know someday we'll see number 98 joining number 93 up in canton robert mathis thanks for joining us here on this episode of overtime here on the colts audio network so long <laughs>